Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions or if you want to add any comments or context to my presentation. Um, it should be pretty straightforward, um, but since I had COVID, I am like the, I guess, sicker substitute teacher, which is, uh, I borrowed these slides from cohort four and Steven, who uh, I've worked with at Cohio. So uh, shout out to Steven. And I think he built his slides or, or worked off cohort one. So it's a giving community. Um, so we're going to learn about environments and hopefully the screen is big enough and you can read. Uh, but going back to uh, chapter six, R has four primary uh, scoping rules, um, name masking, names defined inside a function, mask names outside the function, and if the name can't be found, R looks one level up. Uh, this concept is uh, the same with environments as well. Um, if you use a name in a function call, objects that are not functions get ignored in the search. Uh, it's something else to know. Every time a function is called, a new environment gets created. Um, and and dynamic lookup, R looks for values only when it needs them, uh, when the functions actually run. Um, some key takeaways. Uh, during my workshop at the R Studio conference, uh, I think it was Ian who said, environments are just a fancy list. Uh, so I. I like that, added that to the slides. Uh, so basically they bind a set of names to a set of values, um, but there are some differences between environments and list. Um, every name must be unique. Uh, the names in an environment are not ordered. Um, each environment has a parent and environments are not copied when modified. Um, so the, the book said like environments are like, the, like a mixed bag of stuff basically. So starting off with the basics, um, there are a couple ways to create new environments using rlang or the uh, base r version. Uh, some slight differences in how um, variables are bound to the environment. You can create variables uh, inside using rlang or like normal assignment uh, using the base R version. Uh, to view an environment, uh, you need a specific function for that. Otherwise, it, it will just print out the location. Uh, so here we have rlang environment print, and it will print out the environment location, its parent, and all the bindings within, and what uh, what types the values have, or what class, I should say. And you can also use um, environment names or base names to get a list of the bindings within. And uh, sorry if you hear background noise, one of my dogs is snoozing. 
So there are a few important environments to, to know about. Um, one of these is the, the current environment and uh, Advanced R said, for the most part, you probably won't have to deal directly too often with environments, um, but the current environment is probably what you're most comfortable with. Um, it's where your code get, gets executed. Um, so here we assign um, one to X and we can see that it is in our current environment. So a couple ways to view your current environment. Uh, there's also the global environment as well. That's another important concept. And the global environment and the current environment are the same in this, this instance. Uh, empty environment is just, it's empty, so it, it will show um, value of character zero. And then uh, the function environment is, um, specific to when the function is getting run. So here, um, here we have this uh, simple function. And when we run it, it shows um, the pres the the current environment, and as well as the parent environment. And so this environment is the function environment that gets printed out. And the parent is the global environment. So each time you run a function, it has its own specific uh, environment. There's also the package environment as well. Um, and you can list all the packages that you have uh, loaded and you can search within each package as well. <clears throat> so this is taking the second position Rlang and listing the first 10 functions within. And so the first like eight are infix operators um, followed by more functions. Um, I'll just go over this bonus, but <clears throat> we don't necessarily have to get into it. Here's a special function um, and it's a little quiz. Why does caller environment return two different environments and where is internal argument environment coming from? <clears throat> so here we have um, CE, ACE and dot CE. So three different environments. Um, the internal or dot ce and the argument which is ace are both the same environment but the external external one ce is different So I'll just give you like a moment to look that over and think about it. Um, and then we'll return to that. 
later, hopefully. Um, yeah, I think I think that's the case, Federica. Yeah, yeah. Well, how uh, why uh, uh, I will do that? Why we use work to create this uh, uh, new environment? So this applies a function, which yeah, I, so that's I a good I, yeah. That's a good question. Um, and I probably should have had an answer to that. I have different internals argument, external, internal argument. So they are new environments. Is that right? Um, no, what is that? Color environment. Okay, let's let's see this one. are you uh are you putting it in your r yeah session? it says get properties of the current or color frame now put in the chart okay <clears throat> The properties of the current frame. Okay, so it calls the environment and then assign a message. To this environment, which is internal argument and external. And this work applies this function to each element. Yeah. Yeah, I think the I think the differences are like com comparing the argument, the caller environment from the argument versus inside the function. Um, <clears throat> but if you want to, if you want to copy this down. Um, <clears throat> And stew on this while while I come back to that. That was uh, that was a bonus anyway. So. Like in the preview uh, from chapter six, every environment has a parent. So this was how Hadley uh, represented uh, each environment with different items um, and showing each parent an ancestral relationship. Um, and every environment will eventually end uh, at the empty environment. The empty environment is one exception that does not have a parent. So the parent environment can be specified, uh, the calling environment will be used otherwise. You can call using rlang or parent.env. 
So to check if um, these are identical, um, and you can also use uh, base R with parents as well. Um, R searches the parent environment and all ancestors sequentially until the empty environment. Um, and the sequence of environments ends with the empty environment, like in that picture. You can retrieve all ancestors using Rlang envir parents. Uh, default ends with global. Um, and you can change the default if you want. Uh, the empty, it's empty because it has no names or bindings, has no parents, and always the last environment on the search path. So you can change the default and make the empty your last environment. So instead of just showing current and global, uh, it will show all the packages as well, um, ending with the empty environment. Uh, super, super assignment, something that you Typically won't need um, overwrites existing variable with same name in a parent or assigns a new variable in the global environment. Uh, so yeah, generally to be avoided, but there are some modified use cases. Here's an example iteration over many items with an expensive needle in the haystack search operation. So basically searching for a specific uh, letter in the alphabet and then um, returning the results. So yeah, something something that you probably uh, won't utilize, but is uh, I think it can be useful in, in pack like package building as well. Um, getting and setting. Uh, there's some similarities to. Um, uh, data frame and list that we've worked with before. Uh, dollar sign and uh, double brackets can be used with named entries, but not numeric indices. Uh, so this will work, but using the numeric indices will throw you an error. The single bracket does not work with environments. A double bracket and dollar sign return null if the binding does not exist. And binding a name to null does not remove it. Uh, but there is, if you do want to remove it, there is a specific way to do that. Um, other functions, uh, there's base assign, it adds a binding using a string value in environment. Uh, Rlang poke adds a binding using environment uh, string and a value. Uh, there was a note on why it was poke and not um, set or, or maybe it was something else. And I think I think it was something about the language of uh,
I I forget why exactly, but it was it was specific language for using poke. Um, environment bind takes a specified environment and binds multiple values. Um, you can determine if it has variables by names, and you can unbind uh, from an environment. And I think that's um, I think unbinding is what you want if you want to remove it. Um, this was this was Stephen's additional. Uh, he added this as well. To the regular notes, uh, just some untidy hacks that he created and put together um, using the uh, uh, this package, which I'm not about to pronounce. Um, because I don't know the right pronunciation. <laughs> Uh, Madrid. Uh, Madrid is fine. Madrid. Uh, Madrid. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. I thought this. Um, I don't think I've ever seen this, and maybe there's a reason why. But this allows you to pass the results of a step in a pipe around the next step. Um, Again, he said very untidy, so this may or may not be useful. Um, but for this like example, um, he takes the results of this and it gets passed to this next line, but doesn't, that next line doesn't pass it on to this third line. Uh, this line also passes it to here as well. So I, I don't know, I just thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. What, what was this um, pipe with the capital T? What was that? Uh, I don't know what it's called. Um, let me see. It must be in McGritter. T pipe is what it's called. This is useful when an expression is used for its side effect, say plotting or printing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So take a look at the McGritter uh, package if you want to learn more about that. Um, advanced bindings. There are two types, delayed and active. Um, um, evaluate the first time they are accessed active recomputed each time they're accessed. Um, so delayed uh, here, we can see the first time that it's delayed uh, one second and then uh, both calls give the same output, though executed at different times. Um, advanced bindings. Um, and here we get the different outputs um, 
for the active bindings. So the run if uh, will return um, a value from zero to one and we get two different uh, values returned. Um, I thought this was this was pretty interesting. Um, if you're not familiar or if you haven't um, read about recursive functions before or previously, um, I'm not sh really sure if it's something that's um, common in the R language. Uh, but here in the book, we have um, a recursive function that basically searches through a stack of environments and then um, will return if it's found or uh, if it's not found, it will say can't find the environment. So they also um, they also did a while loop and maybe an uh, another loop in the book, um, but I thought this was I I think recursive functions are can be hard to like grab your head around, but I thought this was um, a good use case of it. Um, and I saw, I saw in other, uh, other notes about environments, um, like you can think of them as basically like folders within your computer desktop and there's like folders within folders. Uh, you might have something in your documents folder and you might have something within that folder. And so it's kind of a similar mental image when thinking about environments in R. So looking at special environments, um, package environments uh, behave a certain way. Uh, each time you attach a package, it becomes the parent of the global environment. And the most recently attached one becomes the immediate parent of the global environment. So if you attach ggplot, and then you attach dplyr, that will become uh, the most recent parent of global environment, but if you attach another uh, package, um, like uh, McGregor, then that will become the most recent parent. And so all the packages that you have attached um, will, will will be in your like paths linearly from when you attach them. Uh, the search path is the sequence of environments containing all attached packages, continuing to the empty environment. So Trevin, quick, uh, quick question. Am I right that there's no way to change the um, change the sequence of kind of parent paths. So, so basically, let's let's say I, you know, I load I load a particular package, then that's going to be the parent to the global environment. I load yeah. a second package, then that becomes the immediate parent. There's is there any way in which to change the 
to kind of like, you know, I guess in, in your stack analogy to kind of change the order of elements in the stack. I don't have any practical application for this. It's just kind of a little curiosity. Yeah, I think, I think maybe maybe restarting R and changing the way you just changing the order that you attach them in would be my first thought. Um, let's see, what is the, uh, I lost where I'm, I lost where I am. Let's see. Yeah, maybe we, we can, maybe we'll do that here. Um, Arlang search environments. Yeah, would um, would you have, uh, there might be other ways to do that as well. Um, Does anyone else have any um, thoughts on that? I'm definitely going to look after after our session, and uh, I'll I'll report back if if I if I find anything. It's again, it's just a a small point of curiosity. Um, this this makes a lot of sense and makes um makes all of the advice about uh you know being careful about um, um namespacing functions that you invoke uh all, all that more relevant because you can see here like what's what behind the scenes causes um causes our maybe to pick up like a function that would be the immediate so the last loaded package right which would be the parent environment to the global environment right uh, and would look for look for function names in that in that environment. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, restarting your session will unattach those packages, and then if you wanted a specific order, it looks like you could do that. Um, I'm not sure. There's probably different ways as well or maybe they're better maybe they're not but that's uh yeah that's what i've saw for, for now but yeah that's a good question um so yeah our our search ends that's i just did that on one of my sessions um, and it listed all the environments. Uh, so use that if, if uh, you wanna see what's in your, in your space. Um, and the last two packages on the search path are always auto loads and the base environment. Um, and the base will always be um, base will always be loaded, uh, and I think auto loads is what loads attached data sets in um, in packages. Uh, Back to the function environment, uh, a function binds the current environment when it is created, i.e. this becomes the parent environment of the function environment. Um, if you, if you remember the bonus that's uh, on this slide, a name is typically bound to a function on function creation, unless the function is anonymous and passed as an argument. And the environment in which a name is bound to a function is not necessarily the environment that the function binds. So 
So why does the bonus show environment and close fresh for external? Um, the hint is uh, take a look at eval. Um, so I think maybe in the interest of time, I will leave that as an actual bonus. What, what do you mean for bonus? Uh, if you, if you want to just, uh, think through the reasoning behind, uh, the, the this code chunk. And why, uh, why the environments were different from each other? So if you if you just want to do that, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. Um, a function binds the global environment, even if bound to another environment. Um, so uh, we have the function environment, the global environment. Is the caller and the parent the same? Uh, yes. Um, and X does not exist. Uh, I think that's maybe from inherits. I'm not sure on that one. <clears throat> um, and you can <clears throat> access the environment of a function uh, using rlang or environment to access the environment of a function. So those are both identical. <clears throat> Um, namespaces, yeah, this is this is kind of what Arthur was getting at a little bit. <clears throat> um, the package environment accessible on the search path. Only exported functions will be shown in the environment explorer or with LS. Uh, the namespace environment is internal to the package. Uh, all bindings in the package environment are found here. Access internal functions with uh, package and uh, triple dot. Names are bound to the package function in both the package and namespace environments, but the function environment specifically sees the namespace environment. And I think, oh yeah, here's a detailed map <clears throat> of namespaces and parents of namespaces. So here we have um, the standard deviation function. A user calls the function via name in the package environment, but the function uses the same names to find in the namespace environment. Um, so here, <clears throat> here we have uh, the namespace environment with the dependencies um, being its parent and uh, the namespace uh, for base being the parent of the dependencies and the global environment. Um, <clears throat> being that parent. And so it, <clears throat> it kind of works, it works its way through um, to the global environment.
what are the parents of the namespace environment, um, an imports environment, all functions, all the function dependencies from other packages defined in the namespace file. So if you were creating your own package, then <clears throat> if you had other packages that you were using within your own, those would be uh, packages that you'd want to include in that namespace file. Uh, the base environment as well, and the global environment. So that's a good overview. Trevin, I, I have a maybe like a double question. Maybe this is just kind of to um, bookmark something for 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 all of us. Uh, I I don't know if the, the, there was meant there's a package that was mentioned during um, R Studio Conf that was called Box, which seems yeah. like it's a different way different way of um, of loading functions, and I'm. I guess my kind of question, and this is maybe something we can come back to, is whether whether that changes any of this model, or if, or if this kind of fundamental model of R's behavior remains, but just kind of the the user um, the user experience maybe 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 changes. So, like one thing I thought that was kind of interesting with with the, the box package is it seems like like with, um, or at least so I understand, like with Python and other programming languages, you can import particular elements of a uh, like functions from a pack, uh, a, li a library. Yeah, and and you can also alias them, right? So in a certain sense, you change the name of the namespace uh, mm. for for practical considerations. Yeah. So like. You like can make Python. like dplyr be like uh, like import dplyr as d, and mm -hmm. then you can refer yeah. to, you know, like the namespace of dplyr is simply d, an alias for dplyr. Okay. At least that's the way I understand it. Yeah, like <clears throat> Python, you can do pandas as pd or or whatever. Um, I I think I need to check out box a little bit more. Um, yeah, I think I heard them talking about that in the Rhino session and maybe a few other areas. Um, my first thought is it's probably the same, like overall, like same internal behavior, but I guess I can't say that for certain without like looking into it more. But yeah, that's that's definitely that might be some uh, some homework. <laughs> Another thing that I, I guess uh, you know, maybe is, is, is homework is that as as you were talking, I was thinking. I guess again, thinking back to our studio conf uh, mm -hmm. with, with kind of uh, the uh, uh, I guess admission of Python as kind of like a first class citizen in a certain sense within within the the, the, the I guess now posit ecosystem. I'm I'm wondering if from the perspective of are if you kind of instantiate a, a Python environment, I mean, I wonder how it's considered from the perspective of R. Is it some just parallel process that can pass information back and forth to R in some fashion, or is it is it, it you know, like a named environment unto itself? Uh, you know, like how reticulate does it? Or I, I'm not a Python user. I've never used any of this, but I was just kind of wondering for myself what, how how that would work. Yeah, Again, that, probably homework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting too. Uh, that might be that might be something I definitely need to learn more about if I'm going to do uh, both shiny for R and shiny for Python. <laughs> but yeah, definitely, definitely good points for sure. Um, yeah, I'll try to make the, the rest of this quick. Um, 
So execution environments uh, create fresh when the function is called, not the same as a function environment. Uh, the parent is the function environment. Uh, the environment is ephemeral and will disappear unless explicitly saved. So, does the does the browser uh, function basically kind of like open up a working window into that into that execution environment? Oh, uh, you you know what I mean? Like you stick yeah, a browser yeah. function and, and yeah. you kind of have this different. You can sort of stop your function in mid execution and kind of see what what's what's going on inside the function at kind of execution time, or at least, again, that's my understanding. Um, that sounds right. Um, yeah, like it, it just opens up the ephemeral uh, like environment at that time. I think, <clears throat> but the, like the book had an example, um, like if you call this function multiple times, what should you expect? Um, and since it's creating a new, brand new environment each time, um, uh, you might think it iterates and increases in value, but it stays, the same and you get the same value each time. <clears throat> uh, you can return it from the function and preserve it if, uh, if you have a reason to do that. <clears throat> return an object with the environment bound to it, e.g. a function created in the function will have the execution environment as its own environment function. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, this was pretty, pretty hard, pretty uh, interesting to wrap my brain around. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the caller environment, the environment the function was called from, the environment where function values will be returned to. In the call stack, um, as functions can call each other, there can be multiple functions evaluating simultaneously. Thus, call stacks can be simple, linear, or nested and branched. Um, here is a simple call stack where we have a function f1 um, and a, a function f2 inside um, and a, another function. So we, here we have a call stack and um, and there is the output. So this uh, this shows kind of the linear linear path of uh, your call stack. Um, pretty helpful if if you need to search through where you're getting an error or debugging. Um, and you can, you can search through the call stack as well. Um, and I'll skip, I'll skip that for now in the interest of time. Uh, lazy evaluation can lead to multiple branches of the call stack. Um, yeah, here it, it gets um, 
like a little more complicated. Uh, from the trace back, we can see that the function calls avoided evaluating F1 until C called X explicitly, which contained the call to F1. So yeah, you can definitely get more uh, complicated in the call stack as well. Let's see here, okay. Uh, frames, each tier of the call stack is called a frame i.e. function in progress corresponds to a frame of that stack. Each frame is characterized by an expression and an environment. Uh, usually the execution environment, the environment of the global frame is the global environment and using eval generates frames where the environment is a wild card. And each frame is characterized by a parent, the previous call in the stack. Um, R does not use dynamic scoping. Uh, more on that in chapter 20, so probably sometime in the fall. And then as a data structure, um, using environments you can avoid copies of large data um, environments have reference sem semantics you'll never accidentally create a copy um, that will come up when we go over our six objects uh, managing state within a package explicit environments are useful in packages because they allow you to maintain state across function calls and they can be used as a hash map as well. A hash map is a data structure that takes um, a maximum of one cycle time to access an object guaranteed. Um, so those work. Uh, questions from the book just over the chapter. Uh, we don't have to go over those now. Um, and then that <clears throat> that is the chapter on environments. Um, yeah, it looks like we are at about time. So I can end there. And if anyone has any questions or comments, uh, we, we can definitely uh, bring those up. Has, has anyone used uh, the package with R or wither? I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Yeah, I think so, but I don't remember now what it, what it was. So I, I, th I think I, I think it kind of like creates. If I remember correctly, I've, I've I've used it in the context of um, modifying an environment. I guess an environment for 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 test for testing for running tests. So I, I think basically, I seem to remember like you can create. Um, the, I guess you can kind of create bindings in an environment when you're when you're executing a test, and I think that environment is. Um, I'll, I'll have to come back with maybe a better a better example, but I I I I, I seem to, rec to recall it has something to do with 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 environments. Um, uh, Trevenu, were you nodding your head? Had you used it before? I th I think that came up in. I think that came up in my package creation class. Um, yeah, I, I think that might have been the first time I, I heard about it. Um, and I can't remember if we were, were using that for like testing purposes for our own package or I forgot what the main purpose was for. 
that, that was something like creating a temporary file or something like that. So for a temp file, um, and then you then can refer to a parent directory. There was, um, I've seen it, I've heard about that. Maybe maybe for this I'll, I'll if only to help myself remember kind of what it does and how how if at all it pertains to environments I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll try to post something on 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 Slack um, and that, that maybe talks about it but I, I seem to recall it it something to the effect that it allows you to temporarily change the values of things in the environments for. Um, for like I, I guess thinking about testing you can you can. I think it's like you can, um, for example, I was doing testing of a of a of a package I, I've developed that that um, it's a it's a wrapper 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 for an API, and so I think I could basically pass I, I could set my credentials, uh, have them exist during the session, but then they're not stored anywhere in in, in the mm -hmm. session. So it, it's kind of a way that I can pass secrets, um, as I remember it, that I could I could I could pass secrets to. Um, I guess the testing, you know, at the at the moment of testing, to the set of commands that relate to testing, and then at certain sense that the environment kind of is 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 reverted to its initial state. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll I'll see if I can I can come back with something something there. I I don't think it was so much creating environments as it was like temporarily modifying bindings in the environment or t temporarily creating bindings in the environment. And then, and then um, it was kind of like this in testing, kind of like the um, build up tear down type thing, but more that was global in scope. So it wasn't just for one test, but it was for a whole set of tests. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll come back with hopefully a more cogent explanation. Yeah. That That'll give me a good reason to go back over that package as well. Um, so it looks like oh, next week we're not meeting, and then the following week is uh, Arthur on conditions. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I, I'm, do you know why we're not meeting next week? Um, it says no meeting on the yeah. calendar. Yeah. But I don't, I don't if, know why. If, uh, it's up to us if there's not. Mm, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why there's no meeting in the in the calendar. So I didn't change it. I didn't touch it. Maybe there was a, a reason or just an error. So if we are okay, we can even meet next week. It's up to you to us. So decide if you want to meet next week. Yeah. Uh, it should be after the next uh, for, for the following chapter. So, if art is okay, we can even go forward. Otherwise, we take a break. Yeah, I think I think actually that um, presenting presenting next week on conditions would actually work work even better for for me. I've got a uh, something for work that's come up the week uh, of of uh, the fifteenth <laughs> where. Um, I, I definitely could have presented, but I think I can do so with more comfort next week. Okay, great. That's fantastic. Un okay. Unless there's some reason, I don't know if this has kind of came down from John, um, yeah. you know, that there's like a global holiday for, for our, uh, our for data science uh, yeah, I groups. But yeah. I mean, if, if so, you know, I can stick with the 17th, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I, I can do the 10th as well. Okay, great. So we'll check out on Slack if there's any condition for us to not meet next week. Otherwise, we uh, we see you next week. Okay.
without representing the next chapter. Yep. That's good. Okay. Cool. Maybe, maybe I'll finally understand uh, conditions. I think try try catch for whatever reason I've been trying to wrap my my head around it for years. <laughs> uh, you know, just enough that I can get it to work in a certain context, but I never can remember how it works. So, hopefully, I'll okay. come come away from the chapter with a firmer understanding. Thank you, Trevin, for this wonderful introduction about environment. So that, that was a bit like difficult for for real. So if you don't use it, it can be quite hard to understand in first sight. So thank you very much. Hope you recover <laughs> very soon. Yeah. So you did a very excellent uh, presentation. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks, thanks, Trevin. Feel, feel better soon. Thanks. See thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.